Proszę Państwa, chciałbym Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to open our meeting today. We have Professor Timothy Garton Ash with us, who is going to deliver a lecture entitled Is Europe Disintegrating? Professor Ash works at University of Oxford. He works at St. Anthony's College and he is the director of the European Studies Centre, but also he's the director of the Darendorf Programme Study of Freedom. He is also a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is a well-known historian. He publishes articles in renowned papers such as The Guardian, The Financial Times, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and also from time to time you can find interviews with Professor Ash or articles written by him in the Polish media. Besides, he's the author of nine books, just to name a few of them, The Polish Revolution, Solidarity with the People, The Revolution of 1989, Witness in Warsaw, Budapest, Berlin and Prague, in Europe's name, Germany and the divided continent, Professor Ash is interested in particular in this region of the world. He was in Berlin when the Berlin Wall was falling. And that before that, he had been under surveillance from the Stasi, but as far as I know, this did not result in anything particularly bad happening to him. And there is one book entitled Free Speech, which was published in 2016, which I find particularly interesting, and um, when it comes to interviews or articles uh, focusing on Poland, um, there is one I like in particular, and in that article Professor Ash says, when I watch Poland, I laugh with one eye and weep with the other. <laughs> which is a very good comment on what is currently going on in Poland, I think, and here is a quotation. I laugh because here are the Poles at it again, incorrigibly standing up for freedom. I weep because such a popular mobilization should not be necessary in a 27-year-old parliamentary democracy. And in the book, in his book, Free Speech, Professor Ash, Ash says that there are at least four events that have happened in recent years and have resulted in a major technological, cultural, commercial and political transformation. And these events are, according to Professor Ash, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the invention of the World Wide Web, the fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khomeini against Salman Rushdie, uh, which I myself think is actually not such an important event for the world, and um, the fact that China is still governed by a communist government. Professor Ash focuses not only on Poland, 
uh, he focuses on Europe as such, in particular on Eastern Europe, and as far as Poland is concerned, he published a very interesting article entitled Uwaga Polska na Zakręcie, Watch Out, Poland is going around the bend, in which he summarizes all the reservations one could have given the current situation in Poland, uh, Professor Ash, as I've already said, focuses on Europe as such, and he is quite critical of what is currently going on in Europe, but this is something he is going to talk about himself, so I will not, not talk about it anymore. And ladies and gentlemen, I understand that the lecture is being interpreted simultaneously. So if you need interpretation, uh, please collect your headsets at the entrance. If you need interpretation, you can collect your headsets at the entrance. The lecture will be given in English. Uh, thank you for this uh, warm introduction. I wrote ten books, not nine. Well, only nine of them were... No, not all of them were, were translated into Poland. The newest one will also be translated into Polish. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to hold a second lecture as a part of uh, eight lectures for the new millennium, millennium series. This um, I'm very glad also that this is an event uh, co-organized by the European Council on Foreign Relations, represented here by Andrzej Lachowski, your former foreign minister, and Piotr Voras, the director, and many other members. For those of you who don't know it, the European Council on Foreign Relations is an organization that exists now for 10 years, um, which I've been involved in from the outset, whose purpose is to create a more coherent European foreign policy, that Europe should speak with a clearer and stronger and more united voice in the world, using our common instruments, to pursue our shared interests in the light of our shared values. And I hope many of you will attend the events of ECFR, visit the absolutely fantastic website, and participate, because we need Poland in there with us. Now, my subject is, is Europe disintegrating? And to start, we then have to say, what do we mean by Europe in, is Europe disintegrating? And of course, there are three different main things we can mean by Europe. We can mean the continent, the physical continent. We can mean a set of institutions such as the European Union. Or we can mean an idea or an ideal, a set of values. I will never forget to my dying day, uh, Bronisław Geremek, one of the really greatest Polish Europeans of recent decades, stopping as we were walking down a corridor in the same in the early 1990s, turning to me and saying, Wiesz, for me, Europe is like a platonic essence. Now, platonic essences do not disintegrate. So when we talk of disintegrating, we're not talking about the physical continent, which may be disintegrating at the edges, but I think rather slowly. And we're not talking about the ideas and ideals, which obviously and the values, which change and are constantly debated, but are not disintegrating. We're talking about the institutions, above all the European Union. And of course, one has to say at the start that if it is disintegrating, it is disintegrating from the highest level of integration ever achieved in European history. There has never been a time when Europe has been so integrated, when most of the countries of Europe are in the same economic, 
political and security communities when most of them still are liberal democracies, when you can wake up in the morning and on a whim decide to take a plane and fly to the other end of the continent and settle down and work and make a life there. That Europe in that shape has never existed before. And it is, by the way, a product of several intersecting circles, not just of the European Union, but also of NATO, also of the Council of Europe, also of the OSCE, and of many other networks. So this deeply networked, enmeshed example of liberal international order, the most advanced example of liberal international order in the world. Adapting Winston Churchill's famous remark about democracy, I would say we are living in the worst possible Europe, apart from all the other Europes that have been tried from time to time. And I hope the students here recognize just how extraordinary that is. When I first started coming to Poland 40 years ago, the life chances, the prospects for young Brits and young Poles were completely different. And those for young Poles were just infinitely worse. Today, your life chances as young Poles are as good, or some might even say better, than those of young Brits. And of course, Britain is now leaving the European Union. Um, I hope that as Britain helped Poland in its application to become a member of the European Union, Poland will now help us in our reapplication to join the European Union <laughs> when that finally comes. But in the meantime, you are truly, and I'm speaking to the students here, among the greatest beneficiaries of this European project. But this project is in crisis. Multiple individual crises, the Brexit crisis, the Ukraine crisis, the refugee crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the examples of populism, nationalist populism in Hungary, in Poland, as you very well know, in the Netherlands, in France. Yes, we can celebrate the fact that Emmanuel Macron just won the first round of the French presidential election, but what times are these when it's a cause for celebration that an extreme right-wing candidate got only, only 21%. And these multiple crises, Brexit, Ukraine, refugees, Eurozone, populism, and other, together create, form, an existential crisis of the European project. This is not just any other crisis. It is the crisis of the European project, it is a matter of to be or not to be. Now what I'm gonna do is, I mean of course it's clearly true that in each individual case, each individual crisis, be it Brexit, Ukraine, refugees, Eurozone, has a set of specific causes, which I'm happy to talk about in, in, in what I hope will be a, 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 a discussion period afterwards. What I want to do today is three things. Number one, I want to put an argument to you about what are, in a way, the shared causes of this all-engulfing existential crisis. Secondly, I want to say a few words about populism and the way in which populism is exploiting all these discontents. And then thirdly, just very, very briefly, I want to address Comrade Lenin's question, what is to be done? The thesis I want to put to you is that, as sometimes happens in history, the seeds of this crisis were actually sown in the moment of greatest triumph. And that moment of greatest triumph is, of course, 1989. The Round Table here in Warsaw, the Velvet Revolutions, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of communism, the end of the Cold War of the Soviet Union of the bipolar order. And my argument is that many, if not all, of the shared causes of these crises 
can actually be traced back to the moment of triumph. First of all, this has become a bit of a cliche, but I believe it's clearly true, 1989 opened the door to globalization. Some globalization had begun before in the early 1980s, but the end of the bipolar order of the divided world dramatically opened the door to globalization. And it is, I think, right to say that the discontents on which populists draw are in different ways discontents around the consequences of globalization. It's not just jobs, which the populists say have gone to the immigrants, to the bloody foreigners, although in fact they've more likely gone to automation, to robots or computers. It's also the social consequences of globalization, which does disproportionately reward a small group at the top of the rich uh, in many West European countries, indeed in the United States, socioeconomic equality has actually grown. But it's not just socioeconomic inequality. Uh, in Poland, the Gini coefficient is no larger and, if anything, slightly smaller than it was before. It's very modest, actually, in European comparative terms. But there are other kinds of inequality. And it's important, I think, to understand inequality more broadly. The inequality of opportunity, which in many countries is extreme. Social mobility has declined dramatically. The inequality of attention. Some people get noticed, others don't. And in many of these populist votes, what the voters are saying is, look at us. We're still here. We exist. You haven't read about us in the newspapers. You haven't seen us on television, but we exist. There's an inequality of attention. And when, I think it was Yaroslav Kaczynski, speaks of a redistribution of dignity, one can't entirely dismiss that observation. That actually, if you were a white working class a uh, young man in a post-industrial town in the rest belt of the United States or the north of England, you had no attention and very little dignity. And then there's a cultural dimension of the reaction against globalization. The classic populist phase is, I don't recognize my country anymore. The change, particularly in Western Europe, has been so rapid in terms of immigration, particularly, often of, of the Muslim faith, but also in other ways, social liberalization, that there is a reaction against simply the speed of cultural change. Uh, in this country, of course, it's a reaction not against immigration, because you don't have much. You have this interesting phenomenon of Islamophobia without Muslims, um, but to social liberalization, which there has been connected with Europeanization. So the theme of gender, that new Polish word, um, is a big one. The, the motto of the National, Front National in France is on est chez nous, on est chez nous, we are at home. And that's in a way the mottos of the anti-globalizing populace. So the reaction against globalization is three-dimensional, economic, social, and cultural. The second line of causality from 1989 is a very simple one. The most direct result of 1989 was that the countries of East Central and Southeastern Europe began the rapid transition to democracy and then became members of the European Union, enjoying the four freedoms of the European Union, which are, of course, a kind of intensified form of globalization, the free movement of goods, services, capital, and people. And I have to say that Poles and East Europeans particularly sees the opportunity of free movement of people. Uh, as a result, since 2004, something in the order of 2.2 million East Europeans have come to live for short or longer periods in Britain, of them about 900,000 to 1 million Poles. I have to tell you that that East European immigration 
coming on top of all the other immigration that had come to Britain over the years, was the largest single cause of the Brexit vote in Britain. That's simply a fact. Um, I don't evaluate it, I just describe it. So there's another very direct line of causality from what happened in 1989 to the discontents and problems of today, namely to Brexit. Let's talk about that in discussion. Thirdly, Vladimir Putin. You know, as a historian, if one looks at what happened to a Russian empire which had grown gradually over centuries to become one of the largest land empires in history and softly and suddenly vanished with hardly a shot fired in anger in the case of just three years, we should have expected a violent, angry, nationalist and imperialist reaction. We were naive not to expect that. Actually, what is surprising, what is remarkable, is not anything that Vladimir Putin today is doing today, not the seizure of Crimea, not what he's doing in eastern Ukraine, not his very successful attempts to divide empire, divide and rule inside the European Union. What is amazing is what Mikhail Gorbachev did between 1989 and 1991. That's a remarkable thing, not what Putin is doing. But clearly, again, there is a very direct line of causality between 89, the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire, and what Putin is doing today, and of course only recently, he interfered indirectly in the French presidential election by trying to spread the rumor that Emmanuel Macron is gay. I'm glad to say with no success. Um, the fourth line of causality is one which I think is particularly interesting. Um, on the third of June 1989, the Soviet bloc and communist China could arguably have been said to be in the same political world. On the 4th of June 1989, that changed forever. Eastern Europe and China dramatically diverged. The 4th of June 1989, here in Poland, the first semi-free election in the history of the, of the Soviet bloc. The 4th of June 1989 in China, the massacre on Tiananmen Square. I, have I will never forget coming back to the offices of Gazeta Wyborcza late on the evening of the 4th of June 1989 and seeing on a television with a grainy black and white screen the first pictures of the dead students being carried off Tiananmen Square held high on what looked like sort of improvised stretches or doors. And of course, they looked exactly like the pictures from the Baltic coast in 1970-71. I've never forgotten that. But from that day, from the 4th of June 1989, we diverged. The Chinese Communist Party quite skillfully and consciously learned its lessons from the collapse of the Soviet Union and tries to avoid those mistakes, created what I would call in shorthand a system of Leninist capitalism, which thus far has been extremely successful in precisely exploiting the opportunities offered by that globalization, which also has its origins in 89, and now is not only a very major competitor to the European Union economically and politically, but also in a somewhat sort of more velvet way is itself a source of division within the European Union because such a wealthy country with a lot of surplus capital to invest can also divide and rule and does. Some of you will know there's the 16 plus one group of European countries plus China, the Belt and Road projects and so on. So this too, is a factor which is threatening the coherence of Europe. My fifth line of causality from 89 to the problems of today is very simple, the Euro and the Eurozone. Now, of course, there were intellectual and economic policy origins of the Euro that go but way back before 1989. But I can demonstrate to you 
from the diplomatic documents around German unification, the German, the British, the American diplomatic documents, that the crucial decisions on creating the Eurozone we have today were taken in the weeks and months immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we see how while Margaret Thatcher foolishly thought she could try and stop German unification, which of course she couldn't, like King Canute trying to stop the incoming tide, François Mitterrand and Giulio Andriotti decided to get something for their support. And the quid pro quo was European Monetary Union. This is often asserted journalistically, but I can demonstrate it from the diplomatic documents. The idea was to bind a united Germany into a larger Europe and for France and Italy and other partners to get control over the German currency. Of course, the irony of this story is that it had precisely the opposite effect. Instead of uniting Europe, it has divided the member countries of the European Union, North and South. Instead of putting France and Italy in some position of control over Germany, it had precisely the opposite effect and put Germany on top. But it's also had, as I mentioned, very significant negative consequences uh, for the South of Europe, for the South European member states of the Eurozone, where many of these problems, many of these populisms have grown. It's interesting, by the way, that in the leading article of the Daily Mail, the most influential popular newspaper in Britain, uh, on the day of the Brexit referendum, it explicitly mentioned the state of the Eurozone and the fact that there's 50% youth unemployment in several South European countries. So it again had a direct impact on the Brexit vote. My sixth line of causality is what economists call an opportunity cost. That is to say, in the last quarter century, the European Union has essentially done two big projects, enlargement and monetary union. But it couldn't manage a third big project. What would that third big project have been? It would have been the purpose of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a more coherent, stronger, more united common foreign and security policy. I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that Europe would now be in a much better place if we had made that our second big comp uh, uh, project, complementary to, to um, enlargement, rather than the ill-fated, ill-designed uh, monetary union. And of course, the cost of that is seen in the refugee crisis. Because why are millions of people fleeing across the Mediterranean however they can? Because the Middle East and the Arab Spring have collapsed into disaster, especially in Syria, but not just. What did the European Union do to try and help the Arab Spring to success? Almost nothing. We had no effective common foreign and security policy in relation to the Middle East. My seventh line of causality from 89 to today is a problem of success. Um, and it's an intangible one, but I think a very important one. It's what I call the memory deficit. So I would argue that for three generations, from 1945 until the 1990s, the most important single motor of European integration was personal memories of war, occupation, holocaust, gulag, fascist dictatorship in Spain, communist dictatorship in Poland. These personal memories, and I, I, I can tell you that from, from many personal encounters, we think of Bronisław Geremek, for example, we think of Helmut Kohl, François Mitterrand, drove forward the European project. Now, the problem now is that we have that Europe, and we've had it for a generation. So for the first time, we have a generation in Europe which has not any of those personal memories of bad times, but has only known better ones, and I think to some extent take those better times for granted. Now, someone will, I'm sure, immediately say, but look, if you look at the polls, younger Europeans are more pro-European. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true, with a few exceptions. Um, uh, uh, the Front National actually has quite a high proportion of, of young, young supporters. But there's a difference between just being mildly pro-European and seeing it as a cause. 
feeling that you actually have to do something about it, that Europe is at stake and you have to fight for it. And I would argue that partly because of this memory deficit, uh, it's not a cause. My final line of causation is a slightly odd one. I'll mention it briefly and then move on. One other thing happened. I think you mentioned, Professor Wenglinski, um, the things that happened in 89, the fatwa on Salman Rushdie, Tiananmen Square, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The fourth one was Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. It's amazing, everything that happened in 1989. And I think there is actually an interesting line of causality from that, that is to say, the thing that made the internet really take off as a political fact and the world we're in today. Okay, so that's the first part of the argument. That's the argument about causes. Uh, um, let me now turn to populism and to the ways in which populists exploit the multiple discontents which are the unintended consequences of what happened in 1989. So the first thing to say is that populism is nationalist. If there's an internationalist populism, I don't know it. Um, maybe there was in the past, but all populisms now are nationalist. It's make America great again, make Poland great again, France, Hungary. British populists, I'm afraid, in a rather cringe-making fashion, don't even say make Britain is great again. They say Britain is great, with great in capital letters, which makes me want to hide my face, but there we are. But the interesting thing about this is it's not just nationalist, it's a claim that we will be better off if we take back control, the slogan of uh, the Brexit campaign, and have sovereign, national, democratic self-government. Some of you will know the work of a, a Harvard economist called Danny Roderick, who has what I call Roderick's trilemma. He says, if you take three things, globalization, democracy, and a sovereign nation state, he argues you can really only have two of them. So you can have uh, globalization and democracy, but that means very much giving up on the sovereign nation state. Or you can have globalization and the sovereign nation state, but that means pretty much giving up on democracy. You leave it to technocratic elites. And what the populists do is to say, we agree with you, and they come into Roderick's trilemma, and they say, so what we're going to offer you is the sovereign nation state and democracy instead of globalization. And this was absolutely explicit in the campaign of Marine Le Pen. She said explicitly, we are fighting against savage globalization. It's patriotism versus globalization. But please note, it is done in the name of democracy. And that also was one of the most powerful and actually most respectable arguments for Brexit. We want to govern ourselves. We're one of the oldest democracies in the world. The British Parliament should decide. And the EU is, as many of you who study it will know, extremely vulnerable to this critique. Because while on paper, it has democratic controls. Actually, the European Parliament has a lot of power. Objectively, subjectively, no one believes it. No one actually believes that they are represented effectively, they're democ democratically in Brussels. And I'm not just asserting that, because if you look at the Eurobarometer polls, they've consistently asked the question, do you think your voice is heard? in Brussels, in the European institutions, and the number saying yes has gone down and down and down. It's now down to about 38%. I'm happy to say a bit more about that in discussion. The second defining characteristic of populism is that it speaks in the name of the people. I am your voice, says Donald Trump. The people have spoken, say the Brexiteers. 
the peace government in Poland, in this country, talks of the sovereign, the sovereign being the people, and that sovereign, the people, ventriloquized by populist, trumps, the verb has acquired a new meaning, trumps all other sources of legitimate authority. The unique source of legitimation is the people. And when the British courts say that the activation of Article 50 for Britain to leave the EU must be done by Parliament, the Daily Mail denounces its High Court judges as, I quote, enemies of the people, enemies of the people. This is what you see everywhere in populism. You are the enemy of the people. All the classic checks and balances, you know this very well in this country, are more or less de uh, demolished or eroded in the name of the people. So that the opposite of populism is pluralism. The third characteristic is that the people, thus ventriloquized by populists, turn out on closer inspection only to be a part of the people. So a better word for the people would be folk. They're always the others who are not part of the imagined people who give this direct legitimacy. And so those others are defined in two ways, ethnoculturally and sociopolitically. So ethnoculturally, it's the Muslims, it's the Mexicans in the United States, it's the Kurds in Turkey, it's the Sinti in Roma in Southeast Europe. It is, I have to tell you, sometimes the Poles in Britain. Sociopolitically, it's the elites, the experts, the mainstream media, the classic populist dichotomy is pure and noble people, uh, pure and noble people against corrupt elites. Nigel Farage, on the day after the uh, Brexit victory, from his point of view, said, this is a victory for ordinary people, decent people, real people, thus implying that the people like me and the other 48% who actually voted for Britain to stay in the European Union are neither ordinary nor decent, nor even real. I beg to differ. Two last characteristics of uh, populism. Firstly, while it speaks in the name of an imagined unitary pure people, what populist politicians, and here Yaroslav Kaczynski, uh, Viktor Orban and others have been very skillful, is an aggregation of different social groups with quite different interests. It's not simply interest-based politics. And these are, if you like, you will have heard of coalitions of the willing. I would say these are coalitions of the unwilling. All those who are discontented, who feel marginalized, who feel left behind, who feel left out, are brought together. How do you bring together these very different groups? How do you glue them together politically? Answer by making a powerful, simple, emotionally appealing nationalist narrative. I think narratia, one says in, in New Polish. That's how you glue them all together. We'll make America great again. Dobra zmiana. The fifth, and I'll make this point very briefly, um, because I spoke about it at length with colleagues at the Batori Foundation yesterday. This is where Tim Berners-Lee and the unintended consequences of the internet come in, because it turns out, and as I say, I said it's all yesterday, so I'll repeat it very briefly. It turns out that the internet, with its many, many advantages, which in many ways is a great democratization of public debate, also allows for a great fragmentation of the media landscape, and therefore for a very strong echo chamber effect in which Trump supporters only hear the views and prejudices and alternative facts, alternative facts of Trump supporters and Clinton supporters on their side. It's your friends on Facebook, but your friends on Facebook share the same prejudices as you. And so it comes that Donald Trump says that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. Barack Obama publishes his birth certificate 
End of story, you might think. Not a bit of it. Uh, Donald Trump says, many people feel that it wasn't a proper certificate. So never mind what you think, many people feel that it wasn't a proper certificate. You know, I may think this jacket is dark blue, but you feel that it's pink. <laughs> and uh, according to some polls, uh, 30 to 40 percent of Americans still believe that, Donald, uh, that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. And I think the, actually people miss the point when they start talking specifically about, say, fake news or post-fact. It's the power, the capacity of these simplistic, emotional, nationalistic, nationalist narratives to prevail over facts, over countervailing evidence, also by sheer repetition, because another effect of the internet um, is that you get these views not once, but a thousand times repeated again and again, as we know from the history of propaganda, what makes a lie effective is the fact of sheer repetition. And this seems to be a very important point. And it's actually quite difficult for us, who are in the, what we call in the United States, the reality-based community, who believe in evidence-based rational argument, to go up against this. I'll give you a little uh, illustration of this. A friend of mine, an academic, during the Brexit campaign, was um, trying to give lectures in which he neutrally, in a scholarly fashion, laid out the pros and cons of Brexit. And he was doing a lecture in a northern English, battered, run-down, post-industrial town with a lot of old white working class, high unemployment. And he started talking about GDP. And an old working class lady got up at the back and she said, Professor Menon, that's your GDP, not my GDP. And there's a, real, there's a deep truth in that. Um, I don't want to hear about your GDP. I want to hear about my life. So those are just a few characteristics of populism as we see it, not just across the continent of Europe, but in the wider world, in the United States, in Turkey, in Spades, in India and elsewhere. Now, in the last few minutes before throwing this open for discussion, I want to address the impossible question um, for answering which uh, banks will pay you an enormous amount of money, namely what will happen tomorrow, which of course nobody knows. A great English historian said history is full of surprises and no one is more surprised by them than historians. So we don't know. But with that caveat, we can at least ask what is to be done in this situation? Uh, what is to be done, that is, both directly to combat the populace, but as important to address the root causes of all those discontents on which populace feeds and the many different problems that I've been describing. Now, I would argue, first of all, and we can talk about this in discussion, that the answers here are not mainly in Brussels. There are a few things that can be done in the EU institutions, but it's mainly a matter of us in the member states, starting with national politicians making the case for Europe at home and not going to a summit in Brussels, coming out, blaming everything that was bad on the others and claiming all the successes for themselves. A few other illustrations of what might, who needs to do what. The memory deficit. I think it's a job for us, for historians, for academics, for journalists, for political writers, for filmmakers, for museum curators, to address the memory deficit, which I think is quite a deep problem of the European project. It's not up to the state and not up to the government. Heaven forbid that the state should try to tell you what is historical truth and how the history of the Second World War, for example, should be represented in a museum. It's for us, for historians, for independent museums and scholars to address that. Journalists face a major challenge which is not simply to establish the facts. That's relatively easy. Actually, the internet makes it even easier to get at the facts. It's to get the facts into the echo chambers of the populists and to get people to listen to them who don't particularly even want to hear them, want to hear about your GDP, want to see Obama's birth certificate, 
They would rather sometimes stay in the warm solidarity of indignation in the simplistic narrative. And that's, I think, a really interesting challenge for journalism. For business, there are many big jobs, but one of the largest is what do you do about the world of work? In a world where, because of globalization, but above all because of automation, and remember, the next phase of the digital revolution is just coming up, there are not going to be enough full-time, regular, old-style jobs to go round. And that fear, that concern, is at the root of a lot of this worry. What's the world of business going to do about the world of work? For the centre-left, there is, in my view, more than for the centre-right, a huge challenge. Because if you look at the populist vote, it's more the electorate of the centre-left. If we can still talk about a working class, the old working class that's gone off to the populace than that of the centre-right. According to one poll, 48% of French factory workers supported Marine Le Pen. So, key challenge for the SPD in Germany, for the British Labour Party, for the French Socialists, Platforma Bevatelska, I couldn't possibly comment, um, uh, but certainly for parties of the centre-left everywhere, um, to find out how you win back parts of your electorate uh, that have gone off to the populists. For President Macron, let's hope and pray it is President Macron, it looks likely. You remember back in the day in the 1980s, we used quaintly to ask, is socialism reformable? Remember that? Well, now we have to ask, is France reformable? And we'll see whether he can answer that question. For us in Britain, the challenge is no lecture would be complete without that moment. Um, the cha challenge now is, after the next election, to make the softest Brexit possible. Brexit will happen, but the softest Brexit possible to keep our country as closely connected to Europe as possible. And in Poland, of course, if I may say so, beyond protecting the pillars of liberal democracy and pluralism. The question is what next government and what next president. Now, I'm very happy to talk about all of that in the discussion period. I just want finally, and I know this has been a lot to digest, but I hope it's been digestible. And as I say, I'm happy to unfold it in discussion. But let me just in conclusion, draw attention to what seem to me two crucial points perhaps particularly also from the Polish point of view. Number one, coming back to the level of the whole EU, and if it's not, if that process of disintegration is to be reversed, what that means is that if we have President Macron, and I expect we have a sensible election in Germany, and we get either Chancellor Merkel or Chancellor Schulz, make some difference, but it'll be a coalition government of the center either way, you are going to see an attempt to relaunch the European project at the beginning of the next year. Part of it should be a deal which says, you, President Macron, set about reforming France because the future of the Eurozone is not secure unless you do. We, Germany, will be a little more pragmatic and flexible in the way we treat the poorer debtor countries of the Eurozone. That's, that's the first deal. But then, in the context on the one hand of Trump and on the other hand of Brexit, what Chancellor Merkel and Orschulz and President Macron are going to say is we, haven't to, we have to strengthen the core of the EU. That will come. And people talk about a multi-speed EU, and in Poland, people say, are we again going to be in the slow lane? People talk about concentric circles, and the question in Poland is again, are we again going to be on the periphery, if not quite as far out as those barbarian British? I think the question actually we have to address is, yes, there has to be some kind of a core, but what is the core? Now, many people assume the easy answer is the core is the Eurozone. 
But I have to tell you, this very disparate group of 19 countries is not a natural currency area, but nor is it a natural political core for the European Union. It doesn't actually make much sense if you're thinking about politics, environment, foreign and security policy, to have a core which has Greece and Portugal, but not Sweden and Poland and Britain. So actually my view is we have to rethink that architecture that we still have, as it were, old thinking from the 1970s and 80s. And I think we have to think about uh, multiple overlapping circles which have sufficient overlap, sufficient areas of intersection, so that together the multiple areas of intersection actually create a de facto core. But it's not a single institutionalized, formalized core. And one thing, and after all, we already have Eurozone, Schengen, Justice and Home Affairs. We have NATO, Council of Europe, OSE. We have different circles. And one thing that enables you to do is to have a strong circle with a core devoted to external foreign and security policy, which can include Sweden and can include Poland and can include Britain. And I think we'd have a much stronger Europe if we thought of it in that way as being both flexible and strong. Now, that's not, I haven't thought that through. I'd be interested to hear your views, but I don't think we should take it for granted that the future just lies in a quote-unquote multi-speed Europe of concentric circles with the Eurozone as the core. That's not, that doesn't seem to me the best or even necessarily the most likely uh, 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 way forward. Final point. This is an appeal to you, the students, and I see some students here. Look, I said it before, but I'll say it again. You are amongst the greatest beneficiaries of what Europe has done over these many decades. Your life chances, your personal life chances, are incomparably better because of this Europe that we have built. Those of young Brits and young French are better too, but yours are just dramatically better. Please remember that only 28 years ago, this country was still a dictatorship, that only 15, 20 years ago, there was a brutal war and genocide taking place in former Yugoslavia, that as we speak, there is a low-level war still going on in eastern Ukraine. Europe has been there before, and it could very easily and very quickly go a very, very long way back. And when you wake up to it, it'll be too late. That's what happened to earlier generations of European. So to adapt a famous British poster, your continent needs you, or if I may put it, adapting John F. Kennedy, I can tell you what Europe has done for you. Now tell me what you're going to do for Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's start with a discussion. Let me once again remind you that this lecture is co-organized by the European Council for Foreign Relations. And Piotr Buras, the director of the Council, is with us today, let me extend my thanks to him. And let me tell you that the Times magazine listed Professor Ash among one of among 100 most influential people in the world. So he is really influential. And let me encourage you to, to discuss uh, your doubts with him. You may ask questions in Polish and English as you wish. A fantastic analysis. 
Thank you so much. Let me start with the things I disagree with. A memory deficit. I've been thinking about it recently, and in my opinion, there is no way to influence young Poles, young Europeans, to realize that the European Union is a guarantee of security. You cannot convince them that it's true until they can experience it. In 2003, you wrote an article on the enlargement of the European Union. And you wrote that this would not be possible if we do not deepen the cooperation within the European Union. And it seems, unfortunately, that you were right. I'm not an expert uh, on history, but according to me, the problem is not rooted in the European Union institutions. No, the problem lies in the impossibility to find a common language. I do not use the term populism because for me populism is lack of responsibility, accountability for political decisions. And according to me, Le Pen uh, is no different than other uh, prime ministers in European countries. But I use the term of nativity, nativism. Uh, this is what uh, the followers of ex-communism have in common with uh, the followers of Le Pen. And for me, the problem is that 50 or 60 percent of our societies, especially those who do not vote, well, we cannot address them. We cannot say on a chenou to them. There is no language to address these people. People who take the European Union for granted. We cannot read them. If we hold a referendum in this room, I think that 90% of people would say we should uh, remain in the European Union and we should join uh, the Eurozone. However, we do not reach the people outside this room. And this is the problem. So, um, thank you, Radek. Um, was it Anton Swanimski who said there's no lesson like a couple of blows to the head from a policeman's truncheon. And that's clearly true, and it's clearly also true in relation to Europe. Um, I have never seen so much pro-Europeanism in Britain in my life as there is now. Uh, I, it's, I know, no, truly, it's absolutely amazing. There's a newspaper called The New European, which has huge success. I couldn't get into Parliament Square the other day because there was a demonstration. I spoke to the policeman and he said, oh yeah, there's a, there's a demo, it's a demo for Europe. And there were people waving European flags in front of the British Parliament, unheard of. Um, and it is I mean, it's like health. You learn to value it when you've lost it. And so 48% of the Brits wake up to the fact of what they've lost. And so, that's, so to that extent, you may well be right, but at the same time, I would have to say, for you as a historian, it's a kind of declaration of professional bankruptcy in a certain sense, because after all, the gamble of the historian is that people cannot only learn from things they themselves have experienced. That you don't actually have to go through war and genocide in order to learn from war and genocide. And what we need to do now is to supplant that personal memory with a sufficiently effective, or not doubtless next, less effective, collective memory. And that's why I think it's a job 
for, for, for you and for, for, for me, and I don't think we should give up so easily. Um, on the second point, on nativism, I mean, I would put it differently. I, I don't think that it's a hopeless cause because people only feel at home in their old nation states. After all, which nation are they at the home at? I mean, the Scots now say, well, if on est chez nous, then on est chez nous is in an independent Scotland, not in Britain, right? Uh, or in Wales. I think the lesson from that is that we have to understand that being European will always remain a second identity. It will never become a first identity. It will never be Nation Europa. And so we have to find the balance between the European level, the European institutions, what we're doing at the European level and what we're doing at the national level, which speaks to that sense of identity so that people can feel I'm Irish, I'm French, I'm Polish, and I'm European, and I'm happy that enough is being done at the right level. Ja, chciałbym, chciałbym dodać I would like to add two more arguments when it comes to the causalities between 1989 and the current crisis. Both arguments might be shocking, I think. The first argument is the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had many disadvantages, that goes without saying, but at the same time, it controlled the West. It was not really possible to destabilize the Western world because there was a great threat coming from the Soviet Union. And now talking about the globalization, you mentioned this Turkish um, writer who wrote about this tri trilemma, and he was of the opinion that the globalization went too far, and I think we didn't have that globalization if it had not been for all the political and social and economic consequences, and this would not be the case now if the Soviet Union had not collapsed. And now the other argument, even less pleasant, this is the culture of our nation. I think we tend to forget that a short time ago, Chamberlain said that Czechoslovakia was a faraway country. Chamberlain referred to Czechoslovakia as a faraway country. Now that perception has changed. Now the Czech Republic and Slovakia are both member states of the European Union. Union, but that perception of the Czech Republic and Slovakia has changed now because now they are perceived as member states of the European Union and not far away, or the notion of the Polish club. So that had already changed, but no, this notion is coming back. Like there are articles published in, in the Great Britain uh, saying that Polish people are not mature enough to enjoy the benefits of democracy. And I talked to Professor Wentowska before the lecture, and we concluded that this was not about the institution democratic institutions which were introduced. This was more about the cultural dimension, like tolerance, for example, and this needs rethinking in our part of the continent, in the context of the whole European Union. You, you, brought, me, you brought me to 10 points, which is always a nice round number. So I agree with both of them. Um, there's a German saying, Konkurrenz belebt das Geschäft. Yes, the competition makes things go better. And that was clearly true during the Cold War. I mean, Eric Hobsbawm went perhaps a little too far when he said, we in Western Europe owe our welfare states to Comrade Stalin. That's uh, something of an exaggeration, but it's clearly true that the competition kept us on our toes. And once we lost the competition, then this excesses of globalization, neoliberalism took over. I think that's something we neglected the social dimension, so absolute agreement on that. Uh, on the second one, absolute agreement too, but I mean, I think it's, I think it's like this. I mean, remember that, and I think you and I both participated in François Mitterrand's attempt to launch what he called the Confédération Européenne in 1990, which was actually an attempt to keep East Central Europe, including Poland, in the waiting room for decades to come, while the real civilized Europe carried on under French leadership. I mean, under who, who else could lead Europe 
if not France. Um, but what actually happened, I think, is a bit more interesting than that, which is that actually, between sort of 2007 on, now that East Central Europe was inside the European Union, actually, a very rapid acceptance of East Central Europe as equal partners in a fairly complex European Union, and Poland in particular as a major player, one of the six major players, along with France, Germany, Britain, Italy, and Spain. That was a huge achievement, so it went. But there is, as it were, this default setting. So as soon as this new president and gov government come along, as soon as you get Viktor Orban misbehaving more, as where you default to the setting, which is a very old setting. The historian Larry Wolf, in his book Inventing Eastern Europe, describes how these stereotypes of Eastern Europe as backward and exotic and barbaric and unreasoning uh, go with the, all the way back to the Enlightenment. And I see that happening again now very quickly. You're quite right, the stereotypes are back. And what is more, when we now come to the beginning of next year and look at a Franco-German relaunch of the European project, whose spirit will be invoked? Charlemagne, Karol Wielki, of course. So instead of the Ottonian Europe, of which Bronisław Geremek uh, always spoke, including East Central Europe, It'll be back to the Carolingian. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Artem Kakorin. I'm a student at the University of Warsaw International Relations. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your amazing speech. That was really interesting to listen, especially for a person who is non-European. Um, as I was born in Russia, I'm from Kaliningrad, so all my life is connected with Europe, even if I'm not in European. <laughs> so, um, Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my question is, oh, before to come to question, uh, when you talked about uh, Europe, you're definitely right because first time when I had the exchange, like I lived in Metman in Germany, like for ex school, ex uh, school exchanges, right? Ex sorry, school yeah. experience. So that was really interesting, and like as you all Europeans, I'm pretty sure here's mostly Europeans, like uh, that is definitely, I had like cultural shock and uh, what you made like uh, your history, you know, like I mean how people here, it's like for future generations, so thank you all I would say, uh, even for only you like me again. So, uh, my question is, do you believe that f after French elections, rise of populism will be over or it will continue to rise in other countries? And the second question is relates to that. Sorry, what was the first, after the French elections? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, do you believe that after French elections, rise of populism will be over, oh, like, right. uh, or it will continue to rise in other countries? Will it will appear in some other? And another one is relate to that is uh, what is uh, your opinion on Scottish referendum to separate from Great Britain and will it will rise like will it affect on other parts of Europe like Catalonia I mean like this is as well like a region which wants to separate from Spain so yeah thank you so much <laughs> thank you very much and first of all I think no one could possibly suggest that Kaliningrad Königsberg the home of Immanuel Kant is not European, so you are a European. Um, very good question about the French election. My answer is definitely no. This is not the end of a wave of populism, which, please remember, is much wider than Europe. I mean, it's Erdogan, it's Narendra Modi in India and elsewhere, and Trump, of course, in the United States. I think there is something, this is an exaggeration, but I'll say it nonetheless, I think there is something like a global anti-liberal counter-revolution. And after 40 years of a really extraordinary advance of liberty, democracy and liberalism, it's not surprising that there's a big reaction against it and it's taken the populist form. So my instinct is that it's not over yet, and there'll be more of it coming. But I do think, as I said, the French election following the Dutch election, followed by the German election, is an opportunity for Europe to, as it were, take breath and, uh, uh, and strengthen itself against the threat. Scottish referendum, great, great, great question. Um, there's a huge irony in what Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, is now 
same. So if, if you remember the, 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 the slogan of those of us who wanted to Britain, Britain to stay in the European Union was stronger together. And now, Theresa May leading Britain out of the European Union is saying to Scotland, but we're stronger together. <laughs> <laughs> Some contradiction, surely. Uh, and everyone can see that. And I have quite a few Scottish friends who, uh, in the last referendum on Scottish independence, voted against, voted for Britain to stay. But if the bloody English are going to take Scotland out of the European Union, then I'm bloody well going to vote for Scottish independence. So my bet would be maybe not this year or next, but in five to ten years, Scotland will be out and the poor old English will be more or less on their own. Uh, good evening. Uh, it was a, thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting. I have a question uh, which consider the causes of Brexit and, and current dis disintegration of Europe European Union. So wasn't it also a reason, uh, a great crisis of 2007 to 2009? Be because before it, there was no, uh, there was such an idea of Brexit, of, of, of uh, disintegration of European Union doesn't exist. And after the great crisis, after the thousands of British children uh, came into poverty after cut spending on healthcare in UK, the problem of dignity arose. And I think, um, I think we, it is, um, well, and I, I would like to ask uh, how you refer to that, to the great crisis of 2007 to 9. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I do not believe in the British comeback to the European Union. Sorry to say so. Then, and you'll support we us if we do. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I am of the opinion that De Gaulle was right blocking in the 16th twice in the British attempt to join the European community. And it seems to me that what happened, it simply confirms his wisdom. But my question is of different kind. I'd like to refer to the, to the title of your, of your, of your, of your uh, lecture, Is Europe Disintegrating? Could you, could you, could you share with us um, your, let's say, prophecy as to the, whether Brexit might mean also disintegrating West? Um, in the sense that um, Anglo-Saxons, um, Brits and Americans uh, may form on the basis of their a traditional relation, special relationship, uh, one block, and uh, while continental Europe, and, uh, the, another one. And um, whether um, this um, problem means or not, um, I would be happy to, see, to, to, to listen to your opinion, uh, the, 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 the definitive um, marginalization of, um, of, uh, of continental Europe, of the EU, uh, in international order, in the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the coming here. It was excellent. Um, I'm a student here also, and I have a question. For example, uh, you mentioned disintegration. Uh, what do you think? Uh, taking new members into European Union uh, will be a good choice. Like, uh, for example, I come, come from Georgia, and many here are also Ukrainians, and Georgians and Ukrainians are also waiting to become members of the European Union. So my question is, it will be a good to take the new members in the future, like, and how long it will take. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Piotr Cichotsky. I'm also a student here at the University of Warsaw. Um, I wanted to, to, to ask you a question about the French election. Uh, ni patrie, ni patron, ni marine, ni Macron uh, is the phrase that became viral after follow, following the election. Um, taking into account the electoral result of uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, Benoit Hamon, who, uh, who, who combined uh, forms sort of the, the, the would have been the, 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 the top contender in the, uh, in, the, in the French election so far, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you think uh, that maybe we have reached sort of a wall on the, on, the, on, the, on the right side of the political European spectrum? And uh, is, it, is it not uh, true that now we will uh, be living in a Europe uh, that will be more equalitarian, more socialist, uh, or the Europe of, well, 
he's not European, but well, Bernie Sanders, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, or maybe even uh, taking a Polish example, Robert Biedroń. Uh, a reaction causes, uh, an, an action causes a reaction. We, we have gone very far right as Europe, and so, and so I wanted to ask you if, if it is not a possible scenario that we will be going to the left, taking into account uh, this extreme enthusiasm that you have spoken of for Europe. Uh, I, have it, I also do have a personal experience of that. I, I, I work for an NGO that is called the European Youth Parliament. And I have to be honest with you, we have never observed more people interested in uh, participating in uh, simulations of the works of the European Parliament in Poland uh, than after the 2015 election in Poland, than after the, the election of, of, of our ruling party. Uh, so so, so, so all, I'm, all I'm asking is, uh, is this, uh, can we expect a leftist reaction, a more positive, so to say, well, I do not want to, 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 to well, call which question one is. Or, or that's I'll take yeah. it, if I may. Mm -hmm. if I may. No, that's, that's Thank you. Thank you very um, much. To Professor Kunia and, and de Gaulle, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll have to go outside and fight a duel. I can't accept the, <laughs> the interpretation that Britain never really belonged in the European Union. But this is also what Henri Bergson famously called the illusions of retrospective determinism. That's to say the almost irresistible tendence, tendency to believe afterwards that what actually happened somehow had to happen. Um, the fact is, the result of the Brexit referendum, and this goes to the earlier question, was anything but overdetermined. It was on a knife's edge. And if any one of two or three factors, a better, more pro-European leader of the Labour Party, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove hadn't gone for the Brexit side, we'd got a slightly better deal from Angela Merkel on free movement to Poopoo, which Britain would have done a year later after the refugee crisis. A um, couple of other factors, relatively contingent, could have swung it the other way. So I don't think there's anything about, as it were, the deep essence of maritime Britain, which makes it unsuitable to be a member of the European Union. Um, um, I'll come back to the disintegrating West, because let me take the, the, the Brexit point first. Of course, the great financial crisis was immensely important in this whole story, and you're right, I think I should have mentioned it. I actually, in a recent essay, said that I see two periods in European history since 1945. The first is post-war Europe, which we all know about, which I would say goes from 1945 to the 9th of November 1989, or at the latest 1991, the end of the Soviet Union. The second is what I call post-wall Europe, the period after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in my view, that period goes from 1989 to somewhere like 2008, 2009, because so much starts changing, mostly for the worst, after the great financial crisis. So thank you for that comment. Uh, disintegrating West, absolutely, except that I think this is a phenomenon that goes way back. I've been writing about this for years. Remember the way uh, Europe and America fell apart, and actually Europe fell apart over the Iraq War. The fact is, ever since the end of the Cold War, ever since we ceased to have this clear geostrategic defined common enemy, the West as a geopolitical actor, not as a community of values and history, that exists, but as a geopolitical actor, has been very much in question. And China, which is the obvious, as it were, successor to the Soviet Union, actually does not fulfill that function. Because Americans and Europeans see China very differently. Uh, Americans see China as a real competitor, a threat, even an enemy. Europeans don't really. They see it as an opportunity, an issue, a problem, but not in the same way. So yes, I think so. Um, enlargement, absolutely. I think it's vital that we keep forward the dynamism of enlargement. Enlargement is the most successful project of the European Union. I think we will see further enlargement to the Western Balkans, for example, the next candidates coming. I'm afraid, well, Turkey has rather ruled itself out at the moment but I'm afraid enlargement to Ukraine will be a long time coming. But I do think it's very important that we keep the forward movement of enlargement. And that's also for another reason, because political communities 
have to have some sense of a mystique that they are somehow moving forward with the wheel of history. What I call, and the European Union had this, I call it the nimbus of irreversibility, right? Now Schengen has gone backwards, Britain is leaving, it looks anything but irreversible, the nimbus is very badly damaged, and so some sense of it actually progressing also geographically is very important. Finally, to the left, look, there is amazing enthusiasm on the left. I mean, go to a Jeremy Corbyn rally, it's like, a Pentecostalist meeting. It's like a religious revival. But this enthusiasm is not widely shared, I have to tell you. So I think there's a real phenomenon which is understandable that in response to all the problems we've been talking about, there's an, as it were, a new quite hard left, Mélenchon, Jeremy Corbyn and others, but do I believe it will win electorally? No, I don't, not for a moment. And I think actually Jeremy Corbyn is heading for a spectacular defeat, just as Mélenchon had an impressive defeat. And actually, I think the main parties of the center left will somehow have to come back to the center. Thank you so much for your speech. Uh, my name is Julia, and I'm a student at University of London, actually. Of, of London. London, yeah, a School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, and my question is a little bit different to all of the previous ones. Um, and I wanted to ask you about China and how, what do you think and how, what role China could actually take and how China could use the new situation that is currently forming in the European Union? So what role China could play? Yes, I have a question. And it is twofold. First of all, in, in the event of a, a win, from, uh, from Macron, which I hope it uh, will, will win. And do uh, you poor Europeans know what they really want? Because it seems that for on, on the one hand, you have some who uh, think that the European Union has uh, overreached. So some people claim that they, uh, they don't uh, feel sovereign anymore, some countries, I mean. And on the other hand, it seems like people like Macron, they think the, uh, the European has underreached. In, 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 it instead needs uh, more integration because he is talking about uh, uh, Parlement de la Zone Euro, Eurozone Parliament, and in, 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 in case he would uh, uh, be the next, uh, he will be the next president, and he fails to to deliver and to reform, to make the uh, bring the reforms necessary, would not uh, would not that be the death certificate of the European Union, given that Marine Le Pen was Trump. third uh, uh, in the last elections, now she's the second, and probably uh, in the next elections, she would uh, win in the first round. And the uh, second part of my question uh, concerns the implication of the, disint uh, of the possible disintegration of the European Union, as uh, it serves as a, a kind of a blueprint for some other integration movements in, in, around the world. Uh, for example, in Latin America, where I, uh, I, I, I am from. And what would be the implications uh, uh, to the, the, the integration, reg uh, regional and sub-regional integration process in Latin America? And uh, would that, uh, wouldn't that be the, the, the end of European Eurocentrism or European influence in the world. Thank you very much. Yes, don't worry. Thank you. One comment and one question. Uh, being French, I think I have a word to say here about uh, Macron president and, and the, the prospect of French reforming, even if he's elected, which I'm not, absolutely not certain about. The election is on a Sunday We're in the middle of a long weekend, and abstention is his worst enemy. Uh, even if he's elected, I doubt he can really reform France. Julie Dempsey was asking, is French reformable? Can it be reformed at all? I doubt it. Uh, and he might not have a, a majority to, to rule the country in the parliament elections, which can mean that basically France will go on strike, major strikes in, 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 in the fall, and, um, and open the way for, for Marine Le Pen to be elected in the next elections. Um, End of the parenthesis. My question is about uh, Russia. What uh, is your assessment of the role of Russia in disintegrating Europe? Thank you. 
Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Daria. I'm a student here in Warsaw. Uh, my question also comes about France. It's a hot topic recently. So, um, Yesterday, Marie Le Pen made a said, statement that she is going to step down as a, a party leader of National Front. And um, as we know, the National Front was uh, established by her father, nationalist, misogynist, fascist, we can say so, um, who people did not like and support. Uh, her argument for stepping down was actually to say that she wants to concentrate on elections. But do you think this step was actually to uh, increase her chance in winning as people did not like the whole idea of the party? And uh, as well as one hour ago, I read uh, breaking news about Russian hackers um, targeting uh, Macron. And um, do you think that um, we can actually... Um, French people will actually learn something from U.S. elections and will not let this um, upcoming information um, influence. And uh, overall, how do you think these two events will actually increase chance of Marie Le Pen winning on May 7? Thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much for an interesting lecture. I ha I'm a student. I'm a Chinese student of University of Warsaw. I have a question about one of your remarks. You said one belt, one road, threat the cohesion of European Union. I wonder how you explain this. I think it will, one belt, one road will bring the mutual benefit and win-win situation to the China and Euro. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't quite get what, what was it that I said that... Uh, you remarked, uh, you remarked, you have remarked, uh, one belt, one road, thread the cohesion of European Union, uh, if I am not mistaken. Thank you. Now the student from Japan. Yes, I was a student 40 years ago. I'm, a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, now ambassador of Japan in Poland. Uh, I'm more fundamental questions. And uh, why do you want Europe integrated? And uh, this answer will reply how far you can go for enlargement. When I make the similar discussion with one of the Polish ministers, he said three reasons. Christianity, uh, no, no, Greek philosophy, Roman governance, and Christianity. It, there was a beautiful answer, but this is the answer to the question, what makes possible Europe to be united? But uh, my question is, why do you want to see Europe united? In, back in Japan, 1990s, our discussion was maybe three purposes. Christianity and business strategic alliance. That means European supply chain. This is the discussion of European fortress and common security threat. I think uh, those three are still valid, but they're getting more and more diluted. I think that is mm, the background of your discussion of disintegrating Europe. Right, shall I? Yes. May, may, may. <laughs> That's getting quite a lot. We've got all the world's great powers, France, Russia, and China. Um, quickly on France, because I'm not an intimate acquaintance of the Le Pen family, uh, but I do think that when there has to be a large question mark over whether France is reformable for all the reasons you gave, and particularly because Macron does not have a large established party behind him. He has a movement en marche. So how is he going to govern in the parliament? How is he going to push this through with the unions? If it goes wrong, which heaven forbid, then what one is told is it's less likely to be Marine Le Pen than her niece, who is the very modern of a modern Populist. So I think that's a real fear. Um, on Russia, I'm going to say very little, because if there's one thing you all know about in Poland, it's Russia, except to say that, um, well, two things. Number one, I think the military threat is real. I think we actually have to put more troops into the Baltic states and make more credible deterrence at all the levels at which hybrid war, including cyber war, might be pursued. Because it's not impossible that at some point Putin should try it on. And, and so uh, I, I, I don't think that's scaremongering. I think it's prudence. If you want peace, prepare for war. Secondly, the extent to which all populist parties see Putin's Russia 
not only as a source of funding, as for Le Pen, as we know, not only as a tactical ally, but also as an example of shared values. I mean, we always talk about European values, but here we are, good, solid, sovereign nation states believing in the traditional family and that gay marriage is the work of the devil. Um, so that I think the, the, the extent of the threat and the extent of the attraction um, within our own societies on the popular side should not be underestimated, particularly also given the skill and scale of Russian disinformation, which using the opportunities of the internet that I talked about is, is enormous. Now, two questions about China, and um, this is something I think about a lot. Uh, I've been going there every year for many years, and it actually connects to the question about, uh, to the question from the, from, 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 from the Japanese ambassador, um, and the question from the Chinese student. 10 years ago, when you talk to people, in policymakers in Beijing, they were really keen on a united Europe because they were worried about the unipolar world of George W. Bush. And they wanted a multipolar world and they saw Europe as one of the poles of a multipolar world. Today, it's a very different story. The story is not, it's different from Putin because Putin consciously wants to weaken and if possible destroy the European Union to divide and rule. China simply takes Europe as it finds it. And if the European Union is weak, hypocritical, and divided, it will take it as being weak, hypocritical, and divided. And of course it will divide and rule, and it will invest heavily in countries like Hungary and Greece, and have the project of a railroad from you know, the yacht, uh, uh, the, the, the container port in, in Athens, all the way up to Budapest. Of course it will. Um, but I was actually only a few weeks ago talking to Chinese policymakers, and they said to me, look, frankly, we're ambivalent about this because this has some advantages for us on particular, you know, we can get inside the European Union, get a more favorable deal on a particular issue, get a good investment. On the other hand, they said, we think about the whole world, and you lot, you're so bloody complicated. There are so many of you. And, and one of them said rather wonderfully, and the thing about the Europeans is, they talk so much. <laughs> you know, so they would, in some sense, actually quite like to have a more coherent Europe, because it would mean they had less people to deal with. So I think there's a, there's a genuine ambivalence uh, 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 there. Um, uh, the Eurozone, Macron, very quickly, I think you've put your finger, sir, the gentleman here, on a real tension. For Helmut Kohl, the Eurozone was an economic means to a political end. The classic story of European integration from forever, the Monet method. The political goal was a more united Europe. Now we have the peculiar situation that we have the means but our peoples no longer want that political end, least of all the Germans, who don't want that political end. However, the logic of saving the Eurozone requires some further deepening politically and fiscally. So you're being driven by the, the force des choses, the logic of the Euros, of saving the Eurozone, reluctantly to an end which people no longer want, the larger political union. Um, so I think there's a, you know, there's a real problem there, and this is one reason why I think it is problematic to make this Eurozone, which has brought so many problems and so much unhappiness, the core of the political core of the Europe. I think we should think of it differently. Finally, very quickly to the Japanese ambassador. Well, why Europe? Um, sir, you'll for forgive me, it's a subject for another lecture, but um, three reasons at least. First of all, because we don't want to go back to the bad old past of European barbarism. And I think that's still a very powerful reason, and I hope historians will still be teaching that to their students. Secondly, because we've actually developed a quite remarkable quality of life in many European countries over the last 70 years. There are not many places on Earth where it's actually better for most people, not all, but most people to live than European societies. They're prosperous, they're free, 
they have the rule of law on the whole, they're quite civilized. In order to defend that way of life in an increasingly post-Western world, we need the scale that only Europe gives. You need to be a giant in a world of giants to deal with Russia and China and India and Brazil. And I think that's a very powerful argument. And thirdly, without being too messianic, um, I, I, I have to recall that the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, Mark Leonard, wrote a book published about 12 years ago. What was the title, Piotr? No, I think Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, I think it was, which was a little premature, perhaps. But without sort of, as it were, Polish messianism being attached to the European Union and imagining we'll rule the world, this is the most advanced and developed example of liberal international order on the planet. And if you believe, as I do, in liberal international order, then for that reason, too, you should believe in the European Union. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the lecture. My name is Tomek Vexey. I graduated from computer science at this university a few years ago. And I would like to refer to the third part of your lecture, so where you were suggesting what we could do. So I would like to ask you what role of the new technology do you see in reversing those trends and fixing the root causes you mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Jacek Dolny. I'm Polish. I studied at the University of Warsaw, Faculty of International Relations. Um, you mentioned briefly the journalism in uh, contemporary politics. And um, my question is, let's start from the beginning, because as we could see in the American election 2016, Trump won. But I believe the part of this cause was because of the internet. And I think it links to this question. But uh, what I could see was an infinite dominance of Trump supporters on the field of the internet. And what I could see on the country, this media counterparts on the internet, the traditional media, newspapers, television, were constantly undermining the significance of the internet. And that's actually my question. How can media, traditional media, react to this phenomenon as internet as we know it nowadays? And a second question, and it refers to the person that has started the discussion, actually. I believe that some people, some people nowadays, has taken European Union and this project for granted, seeing no incentive in educated people over the significance of Europe nowadays. Uh, and could you elaborate on it? Would you agree, actually, with me? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, my name is Marta Kowodziejczyk. I'm a student of international relations, but not at this university, at Wazarski University in Warsaw. I have a question, and I will allow myself to go a bit back in time to the beginning of this Q&A se uh, session, uh, where there was a bit of a talk about your idea of a memory deficit in Europe. And I will, okay, so background. I am 100% Polish, and I must say that I do not agree with you to some degree, because in some ways, and I, do, I see this in myself, and I see this in other Polish people around me, I see this in other Ukrainian people around me, people from all over uh, Western, Eastern Europe, where uh, Europe doesn't have to be a secondary identity. To me and to people like me, well-educated Europeans usually, we tend to, some of us, identify with Europe more than we do uh, with our national state, certainly I do. Uh, on the other hand, there is a large group, and I'm aware of that. Uh, I work uh, part-time while, while studying, and when I meet the people that I work with, they do not have a connection with the European Union at all, or with the European identity at all. I mean, most of what they talk about is honestly the one joke about the curvature of the banana that Europe, the European Union is supposed to be uh, legislating. And my question is, hence, uh, okay, one observation first. In your eight arguments, uh, and I do agree with them, that the sources come from, uh, from 1989, there is a lot of mistakes, and it's true. But I, it seems to me that the memory deficit isn't a mistake, it's a fact. So what did the European Union, the European institution, do badly? That they didn't foresee that the fact that there will come this one generation that doesn't remember the times when we... Uh, Would you please yeah. Uh, yeah, just yeah. pose so your what, question? What, no, did, no, no, no. what did the European Union do wrong that led to this problem, that there are people that don't remember and don't care? Because there must have been something. Thank you. 
thank you very much. And my questions may be about Turkey situation with, with European Union. Do you believe Turkey will be a European Union member, or it's in in the future it will have special uh, cooperations or studies? And secondly, uh, Turkey is, is changed its uh, uh, political regime from uh, parliamentary to uh, present present uh, system, and how will it affect the relation? The, how, how will it affect the situation between Turkey and European Union relations? Thank you. Mr. Art, I have a question. What do you think about the growing influence or rather expansion of Muslims and Islam in Europe? Of, of what? Of mass growing mass expansion mass of Muslims and Islam in uh, Europe. What do you think about it? Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm an Erasmus student from Italy. And I would like to ask, uh, what do you think, how much is important the crisis of center-left parties in the populistic wave? And uh, what do you think uh, does it mean being a left party in 2017? Um, well, you're certainly working me hard, I have to say, with a lot of very big questions. And to some of them, I, I, I would be tempted to say, please go and read the book, because I've written a whole book about free speech and about new technologies and how they can help and how they hinder. Um, the basic point here is the one originally made by John Stuart Mill, who argued that a system of representative government cannot long function well without what he called a united public opinion. And the problem is that we've got a system of representative government in Europe, but we haven't got a united public opinion. We haven't got a European public sphere because we haven't got European media, right? Now, the fact is, there are many, many ways in which the internet and social media, and I've talked about this, lead to fragmentation and therefore help populists. They do actually also make it easier uh, to establish elements of a European public sphere. So um, if you want to find a silver lining, uh, you know, on the motto of the Salvation Army that the devil should not have all the best tunes, then um, go to work on building European media on the internet. Um, uh, Centre-left, I think I talked about, um, you're absolutely right, it is their crisis which is central. I think there is still an elementary meaning of left, which is to have an instinctive uh, concern about the weaker and poorer and more vulnerable members of society. And in some elementary sense, I think that's still, as it were, a sensibility of the left. The problem for the left is, what are your policies? which are credibly going to help those members of society. And the Jeremy Corbyn Mélenchon left did not have credible answers to that question. Uh, Turkey, um, Erdogan, who I'm sorry to say, and I was there a few weeks ago, you know, is turning his country back into a dictatorship and therefore disqualifying it for membership of the European Union for the foreseeable future. But if the question is, uh, should we, in principle, in the European Union, in a long term, wish to have Turkey as a member of the European Union? My answer is yes. Geostrategically, because to be a giant in the world of giants, it helps to have a country in such a critical position. Economically, because it has a very favorable demography and much economic potential. And also precisely, not in spite of, but precisely because it is a majority Muslim country, because that will show that Europe is not what many or well, some of you might want it to be, if you're 100% Polish, a Christian club. Um, it's not. And to the question about Muslims, let me tell you, many of our neighbors in Oxford are Muslims. My dentist is Muslim. Some of the doctors are Muslims. The postman is Muslim. The grocers are Muslims. And they live perfectly happily as hard-working, decent neighbors respecting the law in one of the oldest liberal democracies in the world. And this slightly paranoid idea, which seems to one find in some places in the Polish media and other media, that all Muslims are sort of one step away from being terrorists, is complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. I can tell you that directly from personal experience. <laughs> What, what is unfortunately true is that 
we have these very large Muslim communities. Most of them are extremely well integrated and want to be productive, law-abiding members of our societies, but there is a small minority which is going rapidly in the other direction, which is being radicalized and committing acts of terrorism as we saw them on Westminster Bridge in London and in Paris again and again. And the problem is, how do we address that real problem of terrorism without alienating these majority Muslim communities who want to be members of our societies and one day will help to pay mine and maybe even your pensions. Um, uh, so that's a challenge to us. Well, you certainly don't do it by suggesting that all Muslims are terrorists. Um, to the lady who is 100% Polish, uh, if I may say so, and, and, and don't take this unkindly, where's the other 100%? <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't believe in anyone who is 100% just one thing. I don't actually know anyone who is only 100% Welsh or Christian or Jewish or communist or whatever it may be. We actually all have complex multiple identities. That's the way we are. That's what it is to be human. Cultural purity is an oxymoron, as Anthony Appiah said. And so I think we should embrace those multiple identities. And a very important, although as I say, a second identity is the one of being um, a, a, a European. So maybe you could be 100% Polish, but also 20% European. Uh, as a professor of genetics, I will add also that we all we have 4% of Neanderthal genes. So we are not <laughs> very pure. Even I, I, I'm suspicious. proud of my inner Neanderthal, yes. <laughs> OK, the last... Uh, uh, the last series series of of questions. We start over there. Uh, good evening. I would like to refer to the title of the of the lecture. Let's look at the facts. The right wing uh, candidate, the right wing populist candidate, uh, lost the presidential elections in Austria. Wilders has just lost the elections in the Netherlands. And Marie Le Pen, we probably lose the elections in a few weeks. Do you believe that the Trump's presidency, the last year referendum in, in the United Kingdom and triggering the Article 50 is a wake up call for the rest of us in the European Union? I'm Katarzyna Żukrowska from Warsaw School of Economics, and I would like to uh, ask you about Brexit, about Britain, and the future of Britain. Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit, uh, you said that it should be the lightest, uh, uh, the lightest uh, Brexit that is uh, possible. What will be the relations, according to you, with Europe, with the US, with the Asian countries, and it was said in the, in the campaign that Britain wants to go closer to the center of uh, economy, which is moving to Asian countries. And uh, uh, what will be the, 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 the um, uh, general uh, attitude of uh, British people who are in favor of staying? What will happen internally with, uh, uh, with United Kingdom? with the protest of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think is the relation between uh, disintegration of society on this gender level, um, uh, on disintegration of Europe? If you disintegrate half of the society, then how can you integrate the entire like region? You mentioned in your speech about um, uh, like um, the lack of like attention, and I just noticed something here uh, that like the first half of the question part was completely dominated by men, and even though women from this side, this side, and this side were really trying to you know make their uh, um, <laughs> hands hand to be uh, to be heard, and it was corrected in the second part, but. Nonetheless, so that's my question. Okay, proszę bardzo. Przemysław Grodziński, I would like to 
refer to the relations between Poland and the European Union. I must say I was shocked by the result of the match 27 to 1 uh, when Donald Tusk was re-elected. I thought that at least one country would vote against um, Donald Tusk just like Poland did. Could you make any comments on Donald Tusk and his role uh, he might play in the US future? Thank you very much. Paolo Tinti, European Youth Forum. European Youth Forum, thank you very much for your lecture. I am familiar with all the problems you referred to because that's what we deal with on an everyday basis. Like yesterday, I participated in a conference on the European pillar of social rights which can be an answer to many challenges we face. However, in our organization, we are also afraid what might happen to our planet because we want more and more. That's what capitalism is all about. However, we can see the climate changes going on and on, and these climate changes might actually make it impossible for us to implement our plans. And do you think that this disintegration of the European Union might contribute to increasing the climate change and actually destroying our planet? You talked about the problem of lacking European identity in Europe. However, the European Parliament has more and more powers, has been gaining more and more powers, and yet fewer and fewer people take part in the European Parliament elections. How can this be explained? The European Commission is also not elected. The members of the European Commission are nominated uh, by politicians coming uh, as representatives of the member states, so there is no possibility of changing people who are members of the European Commission. So the European people have no um, influence on that. The, it is national leaders that decide about who becomes a member of the European Commission. So how about reducing the role of national politicians and giving more power to purely European politicians. This could save the European Union. This could improve the European democracy and um, the European elections. And in this situation, the voters could actually identify with the European family and not just the national family, and because people would stop saying that it is actually a betrayal of the... Um, home country to criticize one's uh, national government. I think this might be difficult to implement, but this might actually show the cause of the problem. Um, I, I can't fully answer all those questions, you'll understand. I mean, I would just say on the point of gender, this, this new Polish word, uh, Europe certainly stands very strongly for equal rights, not only for women, but also for LGBTQ people. And I think that has now become part of the canon of European societies, and uh, certainly in, in most West European societies, very well accepted. On the far right question up there, I mean, I would just point out to you that was a rerun of the Austrian presidential election because it was so, so close that a few dubious votes meant you had to have a rerun. So. You know, it was hardly a runaway victory. Hert Wilders is still a major force in Dutch politics, and Le Pen got 21% and will probably get more in the second round, so I wouldn't count on that. On um, Brexit, again, it could be a whole other lecture, but very quickly, I already talked about Scotland. Ireland is a huge problem. We have had an open border between Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland for a century. Uh, how you have an open border 
when one country is in the EU and the other is not, uh, if the customs union uh, is very, very difficult to see, that actually threatens the whole peace process between Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, so that's a huge worry. Um, the British Conservative approach to the negotiations so far has been the Boris Johnson doctrine. Boris Johnson, as you know, said, asked on his attitude to cake, his, his attitude to cake is, you should have it and you should eat it. And this essentially is still the British approach, have your cake and eat it. We won't have our cake and eat it. The result will be painful compromises. Theresa May knows that, which is why she's having an early election, to get a big majority so she has more room for manoeuvre to make the necessary deal. So I think we will ultimately get a sensible, although tough, Brexit. The big question is then global Britain. Will Britain on its own go out and make these fantastic new free, free trade deals with India and Brazil and China and so on? Well, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. We shall see. I personally doubt it very much indeed. The evidence so far is that Germany not only has infinitely more trade and investment with these countries, but is much stronger in those negotiations because it's part of a 500 million strong single market. So why we should be stronger on our own, I do not know. When Theresa May went to India and said, hey, you know, we have such wonderful shared memories of the British Empire, something which slightly surprised a few Indians, uh, let, let's get together and have a great free trade deal. They said, we'll tell you what we really want for you. We'll take your accountants and financial services. If you give us access for, your, for our children to study at your universities, our IT specialists to come and work in Britain. In other words, we want freedom of movement. Well, the one thing Brexit was about was having less freedom of movement. So I am deeply, and I have to say sadly, for my own country, skeptical about global Britain, which is why I still hope that if I lo live long enough, Professor Kuzhner and everyone else will support the British application uh, to rejoin the European Union. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the question about the Federalists, um, Marcin Svenjitsky, uh, answer is very simple. It's Hegel's uh, distinction between the rational and the real. Uh, what you argue is rational but not real. It's perfectly logical to say that if you have direct elections to the European Parliament, it will have more democratic legitimacy. It simply has not worked that way. And I think we have to acknowledge by now that it has not worked. And actually, it has one other negative effect, which you will have seen in Poland, which is it sucks those people who are knowledgeable about Europe and most pro-European out to Brussels, to the European Parliament, to the European institutions. And if you take 50 or 100 of the best qualified, most eloquent, knowledgeable pro-Europeans and suck them out to Brussels, that hollows out your European expertise and, and, and commitment at home. So I, I, I personally have the quite radical view that we'd be better off with a Strasbourg Assembly composed of representatives of national parliaments. But of course, we're not going to go back to that. But What's for sure is the, few, the solution does not lie in yet more powers to the European Parliament. Quick, if I may, sort of annex to that. One bit of the European Parliament which is really important is the major party groupings. The EPP, the European pa People's Party, which has Platforma Bevatelska, the CDU, CSU, Partido Popular in Spain, all the big center-right parties. It is to me an absolutely amazing and shocking fact that Fidesz, Viktor Orban's party, the party of a man who has already, in my view, destroyed liberal democracy in Hungary, who is now proposing a Putin-esque law on the NGOs and proposing to close the Central European University, is still accepted as a member of the EPP. And I hope that on the 29th of April, that when the leaders of those parties meet, including Mr. Grzegorz Sketina, that they will at least make a credible threat that if he does not mend his ways, then Fidesz will be kicked out of the EPP. Um, and that takes me to a final point which picks up on the fiasco of the re-election of Donald Tusk. I think it was this gentleman here. I mean, I have I've, you know, watched a lot of diplomatic 
uh, train crashes and blamage, but I have never in my life seen such an extraordinary blamage as what happened to the Polish government. I mean, the picture of Donald Tusk coming back into the council chamber and 27 assembled heads of government all applauding loudly it was quite extraordinary, including, of course, Viktor Orban and Theresa May. So it was an amazing uh, 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 self-inflicted defeat for nothing at all except a domestic political feud. And the rest of Europe just thought, you know, we can't take these guys seriously. And, and I'm not happy about that. I'm not happy about that because I think that Europe cannot just be made by France and Germany on their own. That's not enough. Uh, and it needs other countries. It needs Sweden, it needs Spain, and it needs Poland. And so we need a strong Polish vote, voice back in the heart of the European Union, and I hope maybe some of the people in this room and some of the students who I'm sure will go out to march for Europe, I hope, anyway, to become engaged in, in, in the battle for Europe, which we're engaged in, um, will help to bring that about, because I think it's, it's something, as I would say as someone who's you know, been deeply involved with Poland for, for nearly 40 years, I feel quite passionate about and um, I hope Poland will come back, and I hope maybe the European Council on Foreign Relations can play a small part in bringing that about. Thank you.